Technology is great when it works, isn't it? <laughs> Good morning again. Let's stand together. We're going to sing number 623 in the celebration hymnal. This is not one that gets sung a lot, but I think it's beautiful. And uh, we're going to sing the first verse. <laughs> We'll begin our time of prayer with a moment of silence, if we would. Let us pray. Loving God, it is in the silence that we can feel your presence and hear your voice. And yet it makes us so uncomfortable. <laughs> Maybe that's why. Maybe we don't want to hear what you have to say to us sometimes. We ask for your forgiveness. We ask that you would open us up to hear and to receive your words of not just comfort but correction, your words of consolation and your companionship, your abiding presence with us wherever we go at any day, at any moment in time. Such a privilege to come to the creator of the universe with the little tiny things in our life that we worry about. You truly are great. You truly are faithful. Remind us in this moment of your power and your presence and your ever, ever steadfast love as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught all who had the courage to follow him to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand and sing together once again. We're going to sing number 413 in the celebration hymnal this time. Break thou the bread of life, and we'll sing the first and last verses. At this time, we will receive our morning offering. As I shared earlier, we already have 19 kids registered for camp, and it doesn't start until June. So many more weeks to, for them to register. And that happens. I mean, look at us. How many of you could put a STEAM event together? It used to be STEM. Now it's STEAM, I understand have a truck come in and have all these activities for over 20 children. Yeah, <laughs> I can see your face. We can do this because we're connectional, because of the vision of a young girl, Whitney, who went to Camp Wesley Woods and realized, wait a minute, there's all kinds of children that will never be able to afford to go to Camp Wesley Woods. Why don't we take Camp Wesley Wood to the children? And that's how Camp in the Community got started. Whitney is still the visionary and leader of that program, but it is through generous giving of members of United Methodist Churches within our conference all around us, us working together and being connectional that makes this happen for other churches like us who could never do this on our own. We ask that you give and give generously that all would know the love of Jesus Christ. There are offering plates here at the front where you may give or at the door as you leave today.
Loving God, you are the source of our every breath. Let every breath we take give praise to you, not withholding anything from you or your kingdom. We ask that you would take it and bless it and multiply it in Jesus' name so that everyone would know your love and grace. Amen. Scripture today is the Gospel of John, the 15th chapter. I'll be sharing verses 1 through 17 with you. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He remo removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are then gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. But if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you could keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy might be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant doesn't know what the master's doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit fruit that will last, so the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love 
one another. This is the word of God for the children of God. This morning we have a very special treat for you. We're going, since we don't get to go to General Conference in Charlotte with Dell and the bishop and everybody else, we're bringing them to you. The Reverend Adam Hamilton, who is at the Church of the Resurrection in Leewood, Kansas, is, I believe, still the largest United Methodist Church in our country. And he was kind enough and has been kind enough to make videos each day of conference. So we will begin at the beginning and be able to watch the very opening worship service of General Conference. Hey there. I thought I'd go live for just a minute. This is one of my favorite moments at General Conference. This is when our opening worship happens, so we're finally getting started. And it's when the bishops process in, and we've got the bishops from around the world, over 150, I think it's 150 bishops. And there's something about seeing the African bishops, the American bishops, the Philippines, the uh, Europeans, and uh, and some of these are friends of mine who, uh, who were elected bishop the last few years. And, uh, anyway, I just thought you might enjoy seeing this. I'll show you around a little bit, too, as the service prepares to start. So I'm going to turn this around. And uh, and so the bishops are going to be coming in this way in just a moment. And uh, and this is our this is the General Conference Hall. I'm going to move you over here. And today we're going to have our opening worship, and then we're going to actually have our first plenary. And I'm told that there might be a big vote happening even in our first plenary. I wasn't expecting. So these are, again, delegates from around the world who are gathered here, 862 delegates. And, uh, and then the interpreters on the far end over there uh, translating for the folks in about seven different languages. And uh, this general conference, so I'm going to turn this around for a moment. So this is my eighth general conference. And all of the rest of them are filled with conflict and uh, you know, as much as we were excited about doing great work for the church, there was just always this underlying conflict in the church between uh, some of the most conservative members of our denomination and uh, and the most progressive and the centrist in between. And and I just feel like there's a different spirit here. It just feels, I don't know, there's a lot of people that are just fairly hopeful that we're going to lay behind us the conflicts that the folks, some of the folks who are most adamant about, uh, about uh, excluding people in the church are not here anymore, and uh, and that this is going to be a place where traditionalists, uh, centrists, and progressives are going to come together to lead the church forward, and that that we do have a future with hope. I feel that too. So, anyway, I'm going to let you just listen in for a couple of minutes. I'm only going to record this for a few minutes. We'll have vespers later on tonight, but I just thought you might enjoy seeing some of this. So I'm going to turn this around. So the retired bishops are also here, and so you'll see a few that are the retired bishops. Most are the active bishops. We 
Bishop Ann Shearer, who was my bishop for many years. Bishop and our current bishop, Bishop Signs and Bishop Wilson. say a few words here so this is always the most meaningful moment of general conference to me uh, and it is so in part I look at these bishops as they're walking in the room I'll turn this around there we go I watch these bishops as they're coming in the room and uh, there are people that uh, you know, having been to General Conference, Jurisdictional Conference for eight or nine times, eight times. Hey, good to see you. Uh, you know, I remember when they were, you know, some of them in their 40s or 50s when they were elected, and today they're, you know, some of those are retired, and they're people that I have known and loved, you know, their whole ministries. I've spoken in their annual conferences, uh, broken bread in some of their homes, and just have, uh, uh, and then the newer bishops, and so many of them, several of them anyway, are dear friends of mine, people that I care about. But to see the bishops from all across the world gather together here is just really meaningful to me as they lead us in worship. So anyway, I just want to share this with you, and uh, I'm going to see you tonight. I'll be 7.30 Central Time, 8.30 Eastern Time, with an update on what happened at General Conference today. God bless you, and uh, keep praying for the United Methodist General, General Conference and our denomination. And I'm excited about what, uh, what lay ahead. God bless. show us all those people that we never know or meet that's because all of those people are part of the vine just as we are we are part of something much greater than we will ever know and I hope that you saw the pride and the joy in Adam Hamilton's face the pastor of one of the largest churches in our country and maybe in the globe and yet he is in awe of how we come together as the body of Christ. And I hope that you share that awe and that pride always, that we are part of something much bigger than ourselves because of Jesus. 
I also hope you saw Bishop Looney. He is the tallest one in the line, and he, he hails from the Holston Conference as well as some of our other bishops have been through there. So today we talk about staying on that vine. You see, there's nothing sadder than me than, to me than the idea of being cut off, pruned from the vine of Christ. Jesus says, even if you produce fruit, you get pruned. You know, a, a tree that's producing good stuff still has to be cut back sometimes to produce more growth. And that just sounds sad. It's sadder to me, even those who have elected, chosen, are not known about the body of Christ, the vine in the church. To be cut off from God's love and the love of my brothers and sisters in Christ, I can't imagine. I especially can't imagine after 2 o'clock on Saturday morning. Because we felt your prayers and we felt your presence with us. It makes a difference. I know of a family that one son out of four cut himself off from the rest of the family. No one really knows why. They have paid professionals to try to find him. Since he's left, he's lost mother, father, and brother, and sister and had no contact with the family. There are Christians there are brothers and sisters, there are people in the world who have been cut off from God's church by choice, sometimes for a lack of knowledge, sometimes for too much knowledge of what it means to be the church. I can't begin to know what it felt like to be a mother where you didn't know where your son or daughter were. That's how God feels. God knows where they are, but he knows that those children are still estranged from his family. And that breaks the heart of God the way it breaks our heart when we think about it. Jesus uses this metaphor of a vine to tell his disciples that his greatest wish, in fact, his last wish, is that they would stay connected to him after he's gone to be with the Father. Stay connected to one another so that they would be known by their love. Today I'll use the metaphor of family that you might have heard before. My maternal grandmother, who I called Mom Manning, had 11 children. And before Mom Manning died, all 11 of those children were married, and they all produced children, roughly 50 of those. And then all of those 50 started producing children. And so at the time of her death, she had at least two great-grandchildren. Of one of those was my grandson, Austin. Mom Manning raised children, quite literally, all of her life when she got my youngest cousin I have to say this because it gets confusing my youngest co my cousin is as old as my youngest aunt my oldest cousin is older than my youngest aunt so you have to sort of ponder a family tree to get that for a minute but even if raising all those children wasn't enough she became the dorm mother of a little private school in Greenville and raised another 50 or so children of other people's. And Mom Manning was a devout woman of faith. When I look at her life, it's almost impossible to, tra to determine the branch from the vine when I look at my grandmother's life. Whenever we needed prayer, we didn't call on God, most of us. We just called Mom Manning. It was a lot faster sometimes because we knew she had a direct line at all times. I know that she prayed the same prayer for her, each and every one of her children, her grandchildren, her great-grandchildren, and the great-great ones that she never got to meet, and that is that she prayed that we would know Jesus and that we'd be a part of that vine. 
She loved each and every one of us, and her last will and testament, her last wish was that everyone in that huge family would stay to get connected and to love one another. She wanted the same thing for her family that Jesus wants for his. Now, I will tell you, our family, you know, we don't all think alike. We argue about politics. We argue about religion. She even banned us from discussing those things more than once. We argue about whose kid's the smartest and who's the most talented. We are spread from literally New York to California, but we stay connected. If one of us hurts, we all hurt. If one of us has joy, we all share joy. Because we have one thing in common, and that is Edith O'Dell Manning. Because of the love of one woman, all these people who have very little in common other than Edith O'Dell Manning stay connected. Because of her love, we can love one another. We don't always love one another because we're cousins or brothers or sisters because, you know what, that's just not enough to keep generations of people bound together. Nope. We travel too far and we grow too much. We stay connected and love each other because of the great love of one woman who gave life and her, her love throughout her lifetime. Now, you know that that metaphor, yes, is for my family, and it's true of them, but it applies to God's family very much in the very same way. We fuss and fume and fight over different views of religion and politics. Can you imagine all 800 of those delegates from all over the world? Do you think for one second that they all agree on things this week? No more than we all agree in this room. God doesn't call us to agree. God calls us, commands us to love. To make love a priority over anything else. Anything else. It was Jesus' last, last wish. This was his will and testament before his last will and testament before the crucifixion, that we would stay connected and love one another, not because we have to or will end up in hell. Even that motivation is not enough. But because of the great love, the one true Christ gives to each one of us. When Jesus commands us to love one another, even our enemies, he doesn't expect us just to force it and muster up enough love to overcome all of those things within us. No, he tells us how to do it. And it's right here in John. Abide in me. Abide in me. Because if we abide in Jesus, it's Jesus' love that fills us. When that grapevine gets sustenance from the earth, it's not getting it just from the little branches all by itself or those little bitty grapes. It starts from the very source of the root of the tree within the ground, and that brings it life and nourishment. And with the body of Christ, with the people of God, we got to go all the way to the root source of that love if we're going to be able to share it. There are two words in this passage that Jesus says over and over and over again, hoping that we'll hear it. Abide and love. Abide and love. Abide and love. Abide in love. That is the only way that we will survive. When Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing, what he is saying, that is, unless you are continually receiving my love, continually listening to my words, you're not going to be able to keep my commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, 
mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. He doesn't just command it, he tells us how. Abiding in him, abiding in his word, because he is the true vine, the one connected to the source, God the Father. And the interesting thing is, when we abide in Jesus, producing that love is just as natural as a grapevine that produces grapes. Have you ever seen a grapevine produce apples? Have you ever seen an apple tree produce grapes or oranges? No. They naturally produce what they're rooted and grounded in. And if we're rooted and grounded in the love of Jesus Christ, it does not matter our political, our religious views, or any other views we might have, because the dominant DNA in our veins has to be love. And when it's not, this is harsh, when it is not love, we have to ask ourselves, what are we rooted and grounded in? Have we grafted ourselves onto an apple tree or an orange tree or a briar bush? If we're grounded in Jesus, and I mean abiding, grounding, welded in there, we're going to produce love. We're not going to produce one thought. We might even argue about how we're going to show that love now and then. But what we're producing will be love. So how are we doing with that? I'm going to jump. I'm going to jump a couple pages. How do we know if we're producing fruit? I can tell you. Just here at Colonial Heights, this is not, you imagine the body of Christ everywhere and the love they've produced. But just here, this week alone, in the last seven days or less, we have served almost 80 meals with seven volunteers. Today and every Sunday, almost before worship, we have four or five more volunteers that pack up food for weekend backpacks for about 80 students at Dogwood. Let's assume those are different people. That's 160 different lives that we've touched with two acts of love. Today, before worship, there was delivered to Meridian Baptist Church 150 thumbprint cookies from Village Bakery, our neighbors. Do you know why? Because today, Meridian Baptist celebrates 150 years of ministry. Yes, amen. Amen. These are our neighbors. These are people in ministry with us on the vine who love Jesus the same way we do, even if it's expressed differently, thought differently. We're all on the same vine together. I was privileged. They have a new pastor. Their pastor retired, and their new pastor was there this morning, and I got to meet he and his wife, and I hope to be hearing from him soon. He said, I look forward to us talking. Now, wouldn't that just be something? Can you see on the, your bulletin, you've got a grapevine. Can you see one of those little tiny squiggly vines sprouting out of thumbprint cookies this morning at 9 o'clock? That's how you spread love. You don't have to knock down barriers, and you don't have to jump through huge hoops. You don't have to do great things huge, tremendous things to change the world. Remember, one act of random kindness at a time. Just being a neighbor. I could have gone to a big mass store and bought prepackaged cookies, but guess who else got blessed with those thumbprint cookies besides me and the people at Meridian Baptist Church because I stuck, stuck the ones 
snuck the extras that were above 150 in the bag. <laughs> the people at Village. Do you know that the people who run Village Bakery, their daughter goes to our Mother's Day Out program? Now, when you look at a grapevine, you know how it's really different than an apple tree? My neighbors have an apple tree. You've got a branch that goes here and a branch that goes there, and you could see and name every branch really clear and distinctly. But when you look at a grapevine, man, it is like untangling a ball of yarn. It's all intermixed together. You just don't know where the beginning and the end is. And that is a miracle. Because when the body of Christ is abiding in Christ, you can't tell the body of Christ from Christ himself. Now, isn't that something? Isn't that a miracle that the world would love to see? We didn't stop at the 150 cookies. On Wednesday evening, we packed up 16 sets. That's over 200 dishes that were sitting in a cabinet not being used, and we boxed them up, and they're going to go to 16 families who have moved for a new life into our country who don't know a soul more than likely, but they're going to get dishes that have a little letter that says, we're the people at Colonial Heights United Methodist Church. We're children of God. We're part of that branch, and we want to welcome you here. We want you to know that you are loved, that you have neighbors, that you might not meet us. It's just dishes. We weren't using them. All the little ways. And this Wednesday, when we celebrate the life of John Parker, when we gather together, even though our hearts are broken, we proclaim the resurrection of Jesus Christ to the world. We love on each other and comfort one another. We love on John's family and we comfort his family. And it brings healing to broken places within us. And the world sees it. And the world is hungry for it, even if they don't know what it is. And it is abiding in the love of Jesus Christ. Not anything else is going to connect us together. Now just think how much more fruit is being produced by just those few little acts that we did this week. Not to brag, but just so that we know we're on the right track of producing fruit. Because good fruit produces more good fruit. It's that law of multiplication. Not addition, but multiplication. And thanks be to God, we get to be a part of it. As long as we stay on the vine. Let us pray. Merciful and holy God, in a world that has always been, for the most part, broken and hurting, you have shown us the way the way of Jesus Christ, the way of love, the way of dying to ourselves and taking up our cross, even if that cross means just giving up what we think is important at the moment, and instead looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. It is in his name we pray. Amen. And today, as a reminder of his love for us and his command for us to love one another, we get to do what all good churches do, all good members and bodies of Christ and people of God, and that is to eat. 
We all love sharing in meals together. I think Jesus knew that. If you would, please turn to page 12 and the opening of the communion liturgy will be found there. We will do the invitation, the confession, and pardon, and then I will use the great thanksgiving from our book of worship. Christ, who is our Lord and Savior, invites to his table all those who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear this good news that we proclaim to everyone. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Lift up your hearts and give thanks to God. Blessed are you, O God, with who, who with your word and Holy Spirit created all things and called them good. In Jesus Christ, your word became flesh and dwelt among us. Through Jesus' suffering and death, you took upon yourself our sin and our death and destroyed their power forever. You raised from the dead this same Jesus, who now reigns with you in glory, and poured upon us your Holy Spirit, making us the people of your new covenant. And on the night that Jesus, before meeting with death, took bread and he gave thanks to you, he broke the, disciple, broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This is who we are. We are the body of Christ, broken and given for the world. Just as he was. On the night before meeting, excuse me, when the supper was over, Jesus took the cup. He gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. Pour out your Holy Spirit, on us gathered here and on these gifts that in the breaking of the bread and the drinking of this juice we may know the presence of the living Christ and be renewed as the body of Christ for the world redeemed by Christ's blood until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his table forever. Through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. I'm going to ask Lisa is going to come and help serve, and our musicians, if they will come to receive first. We will be receiving by intention. You'll be given a piece of bread and told that this is the body of Christ given for you. You dip that into the juice, and then you may return to your seat or spend time at the altar in prayer. Lisa, this is the body.
Mr. Brian. Can I put you on the spot? I forgot about those wonderful photographs that you have. Um, oh, we can't. Well, you'll just have to wait till next week. We have evidence of Mr. Holly holding his Robert's Rules of Order at General <laughs> Conference. <laughs> He sent me a picture just to make sure I knew he was keeping them in line, all 824 <laughs> delegates. So please do remember all of them this week um, in your prayers and all of those who have gone before us and all of those who will follow us as we are part of one true vine. Let's stand together one last time today and sing number 656 in the celebration hymnal. Take time to be holy. And let's take that out with us today as a reminder to slow down and take time. First verse, please. <laughs> that you are a beloved child of God and spread that love wherever you may go this week. In Jesus' name, amen.